Bear with me as I gather all of my paraphernalia. Before I get started, I just want to share um, a few a few announcements. But really, before that, even um, uh, some verses of scripture that really began to impact me. Uh, I put these up, you know, during worship. First Peter says, "Humble yourself then under God's mighty hand." so that he will lift you up in his own good time. Leave all your worries with him, because he cares for you. And if ever there was a time for humility, uh, it is now. The, the, the Holy Spirit, you know, we talk a lot about the Holy Spirit and, and the presence. The Holy Spirit is attracted to brokenness, to humility. And this is something I want to segue on, this, uh, this thought. He's attracted to, to brokenness. He's attracted to, to God dependence. He, he's, he's attracted to, to meekness. And by the way, these were the, the characteristics in the, of all of these um, great men of God, men of the faith, C.T. Vivian, who I didn't mention, was the, a close friend of M.L. King and called him the greatest preacher to ever live. I'd love to hear one of his sermons. <laughs> if M.L. King said, you're the greatest preacher that ever lived, this guy's got to be pretty good. And I'm sure you'll be able to find some on YouTube um, just to celebrate his memory. There's certainly a lot on, uh, on John Lewis that, that can be read. Um, and J.I. Packer... Um, a very interesting story. He suffered a, suffered a terrible accident in his youth, and he he was born in uh, England, grew up in uh, lived most of his life in Canada, taught at Regent Theological Seminary, and um, he um, if you see photos of of uh, of Packer, you'll see that there's a huge dent in his forehead. It's from that that accident, and it stopped him from pursuing sports, but it 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 kind of released him to a life of scholarship. Um, and that, by the way, one of the most impactful books, one of the greatest, I, I think, on the list of Christianity Today's top 100 books, Knowing God, that I read years ago. It's always good to go back to a great book. Um, there's so many things on my heart, but let me just do the easy stuff first. Ta-da! Announcements. And by the way, it's good to be here after being uh, cooped up in my... Uh, broadcasting from this place uh, last week. This is the cave. It's much nicer here. Oh, yes. No, I haven't forgotten that. <laughs> Offering. And what's that? The thumbs up? <laughs> um, it's good to be, be here with uh, this very limited team of uh, uh, Stan on, on doing an excellent job on the sound. Robin, as always, you know, with the video, uh, makes this help helps make, make all of this happen. And to just be with people singing is just such a, uh, a huge thing. Um, right after the service, uh, we're going to gather to pray as we always do. Um, and if you want to be a part of that, that has to be kind of a private group in Zoom because, you know, Zoom is by invitation. And by the way, coming up, I believe, because of the security issues that Zoom is uh, experiencing, I think uh, starting in September, it's going to have to be by password. Uh, right now, our Zoom rooms uh, uh, don't require a password. Um, but if you want to be a part of that, email us, tell us. And what we do, everyone is welcome, uh, is we, we just share God's stories, talk about life, just hang out. This kind of replaces the, the fellowship that we get to enjoy in this place uh, when we were gathering in person. Um, but it'll happen immediately after this uh, uh, this service. You can log on to Zoom um, and um, some more great stories, by the way, of, of what, um, what happened on Friday. I heard very briefly, I didn't get a chance to talk to everyone, but I heard briefly from Jan that they uh, were able to uh, connect again with Pastor Karen with Kids, uh, Boys Republic um, across the street. And so we'll, we'll get to hear more of that. 
Uh, this is the new sign that we have now out in front of our, our building, and it's uh, drawing a lot of attention, letting people know that we're here for them and, uh, and that we're, we, we're willing to help. Um, a moment ago, somebody held up. Is it possible I can get a small bottle of water? Um, and uh, please don't forget um, uh, giving in, in this season. Thumbs up up there again. Um, and what, is it missions? Today's the third. Yes. Yeah, yeah this is also missions week. And uh, you can designate your giving um, via PayPal. You can send it by snail mail. Um, all of these different ways to give. Um, let's not forget our missionaries and all of the wonderful stuff that we get to give to. Yes, Lord. Let's pray. Just want to always err on the side of more prayer. More prayer is always good. Father, would you um, be glorified in these thoughts that I, I'm going to share this morning? Let your will be done and your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen. Just when you think you have it all together, um, I spent... Uh, 10 hours yesterday putting together a, a PowerPoint, which I will not be sharing this morning. Um, I will share it. I think there's some important things in, in, in that message that God gave me on the, on the indestructible kingdom, the kingdom that cannot be shaken. And I am going to share it. Um, I'm going to just uh, preach it from here and record it, put it up on YouTube and Facebook, etc., but this morning, as I got up to pray, and you know, the Holy Spirit reminded me, because um, normally I get up really early and I go through the sermon, I go through the, make sure all the PowerPoints are right and they make sense and they're in the right order. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me when I woke up, uh, make sure you, you ask me this morning what you should do and what you should say. And, uh, and then this verse came to mind uh, from, from Isaiah, and I put it up here in three different translations, just so that we, we get the sense of it. First from the, the uh, Lexham English Bible, which you can access, by the way, for free. It's a relatively new translation. But the prophet says, call with the throat, very literal translation. Call with the throat. That's like to shout so loud that your throat reverberates, that you can feel it. You must not keep it back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. The complete Jewish Bible, translated by David Stern, says, says, says it like this. Shout aloud. Don't hold back. Raise, raise your voice like a shofar. Proclaim to my people what rebels they are to the house of Yaakov, their sins. And the good old NIV shouted aloud, don't hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion, and to the descendants of Jacob, their sins. This is, you know, one of, one of the callings uh, that, that, that we have as pastors over God's flock is to shepherd the flock of God. And that means not only uh, to encourage the flock and comfort the flock, and I think we should always err on the side of that. I always, you know, in, in, in my pastoral experience, and I'm not bragging about my pastoral experience, but it's, it's, it's been long and I've learned some important lessons, is that we earn the right to speak into people's lives. But we must speak into people's lives. And sometimes we have to shout and raise our voice and say things that are not easy to say. Um, it's easy to say things that, that people agree with. It's easy um, to choose you know, verses that are 
may be positive or encouraging, but you know, sometimes we have to say things that can sort of get under our skin. And I, I was really torn, you know, after I heard this, this word for the Lord. I said, you know, Lord, what, like Isaiah, because God calls Isaiah to shout, and Isaiah says, what shall I shout? What, what should I say? And um, God gives him a message. And this is in Isaiah 1, and it says like, that all flesh is like, like grass, and the flower fades, the flesh withers, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And he was referring uh, through the prophet, he was talking about the enemies of Israel, that they were quaking in fear as they were seeing you know, the, the Babylonian empire, first the Assyrian empire, then a Babylonian empire arise with all of their masses of troops. And the Lord says, you know, they're nothing. That's all, that's all going to wither and fade. But the word of God, the prophetic word of God, abides forever. And I, so I asked the Lord, Lord, what do you have in your heart? And I, I, I spent some time, you know, just wrestling what he wanted, with what he wanted me to say. And I was torn. I was torn. Because on the one hand, we have this, this very, very important issue of social justice. And I think I successfully demonstrated last week that we as believers are called, that this is at the heart of the gospel. I, I, I put up a couple of slides that show that this is part of the, the heart and soul of the Vineyard Church as a movement. That we, we don't separate, we don't say uh, that social justice is something that's apart from the gospel, but that inherently flows from a, a life that has embraced the gospel. It's like James says, you know, um, that faith without works is dead being of itself. And that um, faith, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. And so that if there's real faith, there's going to be real love. And I think that's in the essence of, of really standing for social justice is loving our neighbor as ourself, listening to our, our neighbor, listening to, to other voices. And so on the, on, that's, on the one hand, we have these issues, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more on that. And then, and then on the other hand, there's the pandemic. There's the pandemic, which is not going away, which is not disappearing, which is not a hoax, which is not a, 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 an invention of those who want to influence the elections in November, as some would say. You know, I, I just got overwhelmed with that, just that whole idea uh, and one of the reasons I, I did successfully, by the way, pull away from Facebook for two weeks. Um, I, I think I, I, I came back just to post something on John Lewis that I felt, you know, I had to say, I had to post something on the life of John Lewis. But there's, the, you know, these two gigantic, gigantic issues. And, and by the way, I don't think it's, you know, they're, 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 they're closely related and so I say, you know, Lord, what does that have to do with me shouting and me, you know, calling out the rebellion of God's people is that, I, you know, I feel, first of all, I'm, my calling is not to preach and call out the sins of the nation, of the community and those outside the church. But to first of all, point to the, 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 the ways that we are being rebellious, that we are falling short and to take the, 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 the position to place ourselves in, in the place of humility um, to hear God. And both of these issues, you know, the, the, the issues of, of the gospel and the, the core of the gospel and the idea of doing, doing right because this is the essence of the good news. Why is the gospel good news? Because in the gospel, a rightness, a righteousness from God is being revealed apart from the law. Apart from the law. And so that Jesus comes to start a community that would live out this right, rightness. And, and, and the, the, the calling is, is to live a life that, that uh, is active in changing things uh, around us to bring the rightness of God. To do justice. 
And again, if you didn't get a chance to, to hear that message, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube. Please listen to it because I, among other things, you know, I pointed out to some very conservative scholars and, and the things that they said about uh, social justice and the fact that Keller said that the two words satkeda, which is sometimes translated righteousness, and mishpat, um, um, which is translated often as justice, um, are, are tied together three dozen times. So, so I, I think that was established. And if, if you have any doubt about that, please, please watch that. And not just my, my videos and my stuff. Read the Bible. It's all over the Bible. But I, I have to tell you that it's in these moments when we pastors in America have to be more broken before God than ever before. More humble than we've ever been. And, and one of the hallmarks of a heart that's broken and humble is a willingness to listen, not only to God, but to the voices around us that are saying things that are different, that are saying things that are, that are challenging to us, that are saying things that we might disagree with and that we might be misunderstanding. We have to be more humble than we've ever been, more broken, more truthful. This is not a time for, for arrogance, spiritual or intellectual. And unfortunately, within the people of God, within this world that we call evangelical, which is very broad, it includes you know, charismatics and Pentecostals. You know, I, I, I last heard a full one-third of those who call themselves Christians in America identify as evangelicals. And unfortunately, right now, our reputation outside the walls of our churches is not very good. And one of the reasons is I think what we're projecting, we're not listening. One example is three churches in Southern California, one in Pasadena, that filed a lawsuit against against the governor of California because they want the right to sing and they're pointing to their constitutional rights to sing. Rights that were fought for and so forth and so on. The reaction of the justice, one of the justices in the ninth, ninth district is that we're, we're in danger of turning the constitution if we don't use just you know, a smidgen of, of practical wisdom we're in danger of turning the Constitution into a suicide pact. That in the name of having the, the ability to stand in church and project our spittle, we're endangering people's lives. And, you know, time does not permit, because the, the examples are abundant of Christians who have been outspoken on social media who now all of a sudden are either in the hospital dealing with COVID or have a loved one who's in the hospital dealing of COVID, some who have died. I've heard estimates of, you know, in, in one particular denomination of over 30 pastors who have died from COVID. Among them, many of them, very outspoken initially about the reality and the real danger and they were dismissing this. Florida, which is now ground zero for the spread of the virus, it's growing much more rapidly than California. It was filled with churches that, oh, they resisted. We're not going to, and they hung out in March, throughout March and April, breathing on each other, projecting the, the virus as far as, the, as they could possibly project. The Bible says when we sow to the wind, we reap the whirlwind. And both of these issues my friends, because again, I've repeated this verse like a mantra. I hope I'm making sense and this is going somewhere, but eventually it will. This is not my sermon. And I'm not going to get to my sermon. The mantra that I've been, you know, the, the soapbox that I've been on is that judgment shall begin at the house of God. Speaking of the church, Peter said that in the first century. And I believe this is what's happening. And to the degree that we humble ourselves before God, I believe that we can come out of this. 
But things are being shaken, Hebrews 12 tells us. Once again, I will shake the heavens and the earth. And you know where that shaking begins? It begins at the house of God. And so the things that, 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 that can be shaken in the church are being shaken. Old forms, old ways, old habits, old reactions, old wineskins. We were singing about wineskins. Make us new wine. Oh my goodness. What if God is answering that right now? Make us new wine. Because you can't put new wine in an old wineskin. We know that, right? I don't know if that line is in that song. But we've been singing, God of our mothers and fathers, come be our God. Come take the vineyard you planted, make us new wine. And if there was a hallmark of the early vineyard movement, if we, we listened to people that were there, is that there was, this, there was a brokenness, there was a desperation. There was a willingness to embrace new forms, new, new wineskins. And that early generation of the vineyard, they, they, for those of you who weren't around, they paid a heavy price. They were criti criticized among evangelicals widely and broadly. They were called the cult. And, you know, John Wimber even came out with a pamphlet. He came out with a booklet, Why I Don't Answer My Critic critics. He was berated. He was called a heretic. Every name in the book. Even as he was suffering from can inoperable cancer and trying to recover from that, he was being lambasted night and day by a famous radio personality here in Southern California. Who interestingly now has become an Eastern Greek Orthodox person. <laughs> He converted to Greek Orthodox, to the Orthodox faith. That's a tangent I don't want to go down. That's a rabbit trail I don't want to go down on. Huh? Do it. <laughs> There's a lot of good things about the Orthodox faith that I like. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to criticize it. But it's just that, he, this is the thing, is that, that and, and this goes to the heart of what it means to be a Gnostic. Um, th these were the things that the early church was dealing with. And, and Paul, you know, especially Paul, especially John, but Paul, in, it, it comes out in First and Second Corinthians, is that people were coming into the churches and they were, they were saying, you know, I know this and I know more than Paul. And, and they were exalting themselves on their, their own secretly acquired knowledge. They were proud of what they knew. And this is one of the reasons why Paul said, when I came to you, I decided to know nothing. See, we have to understand the context in which he said that. But Christ and him crucified. I didn't want to come with all of my philosophy and all of my learning and all of, you know, the, 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 the bragging that the false apostles were doing. Gnosticism. And there, th this is a real enemy. <laughs> Believe me, this is not just my soapbox this morning. As evangelicals, and this is what humility and brokenness this is the antidote for. Is that when we can come like Paul with that heart, I desire to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And take on the mind of Christ and the lowliness of Christ. To listen to my brother. To love my brother and my sister. And to be humble enough to hear what they have to say. And, and this is... This is all that I'm, I'm asking this morning. And I'm saying this with, with the, the intention that I, I'm going to put things up on the Monrovia Vineyard Facebook site that have to do with listening and hearing the perspectives of our black brothers and sisters. And I'm talking about black brothers and sisters that are within the Vineyard movement. So one of the reasons that I'm part of the Vineyard Movement is that we got the message a long time ago. I remember in 2002 being at the San Antonio National Convention, a Vineyard, the, the annual or biannual Vineyard thing. And, and there, was, there was something that the national director pointed out to us that in an audience of 2,500 pastors and their spouse, there were two African-American pastors in the Vineyard at that time. 
One of them was from our church in Miami. And he called the vineyard to become intentionally diverse, to begin moving toward that, to hear our African-American brothers and sisters, and, and to begin to take move, uh, move, movements intentionally. And so in, in the vineyard, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's an, a, a whole movement. A whole, in fact, they have a, a page on, on uh, Facebook. I'll put it up. I'll link to it. Um, about diversity. There's also one on social justice, which is another thing that the Vineyard started speaking on a decade ago. So we're a little ahead of the curve as evangelicals uh, are concerned. Something that I, you know, I feel that we can brag on a little bit. But I'm just asking, I'm, I'm asking, just let's take a posture of listening, of coming just with an open heart and to see what God can do to, to, to take us in this direction of, of becoming New wine. It's, it's only something he can do. But it, 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 it requires humility. You know that the Holy Spirit is attracted to that. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I've heard a lot recently about fear, and I mentioned this issue of fear, fear of change, fear of, fear of reality. It's a huge issue. The Bible 365 times, we're told, has a, the phrase, do not fear or do not be afraid. Or Jesus' Jesus's words um, can more accurately be translated, stop being afraid. But you know something? Almost all of those instances are tied to a deep realization that God is there. In other words, we have no right to say, I will not be afraid, if it's not in the context of an utter dependence and brokenness, which causes us to fall into the hands of God. If we are not de God dependent, if we are proud, if we are resisting God, we have no right to not be afraid. In fact, we should be very afraid. If we read all of these 365 instances, the, the, it, it always begins with this, this, this concern about the things that, that surround us and, and the things that are coming, but they end with an affirmation of who God is. And, and this is what troubles me about the things that I see. There, there's like a, a, a complete disregard for what, what the scientists broadly are saying about this virus, what they know and what they don't know. And so we're flocking to websites and people that affirm our bias. And say things, the kind of things that we want to hear. You should see some of the text messages that I've gotten. They're, they're pretty choice. That I have been co-opted by a spirit of fear and embraced lies. You want to read something that's really eye-opening? Get a copy of the LA Times this morning. And read Steve Lopez's article where he goes to the USC Keck Medical Center and interviews a doctor who has been in there day in and day out dealing with COVID patients. And he tells the story of people that come in that have to be intubated and they are gasping to breathe. That they're breathing as hard as a person running a marathon because they can't get enough oxygen. And he sees the terror in their eyes as they pass away. 
or as they look at their loved ones through windows, knowing that they will never be able to embrace them. These are things that are happening, but we're living in this land of escapism and irreality, embracing the conspiracy theory. And by the way, we're doing that in both stages, not only with the issue of Black Lives Matter. I, I, I don't want to be behind the curve on that, but let me show you something about BLM. This is J.D. Greer, the president of the Southern Baptist denomination. He's the pastor also of a mega church in South Carolina. This is what he said. This is the second largest evangelical denomination in the United States, which, by the way, was formed precisely because of the issue of slavery. The Southern Baptists said no. In fact, they rebuked Northern Baptists and they said, the Bible gives us the right to own slaves. That's how the Southern Baptist denomination started and how the Northern Baptist denomination started. They said, no, you're wrong. And by the way, we're meeting in a facility right now, and this, this is part of the American Baptist denomination, which flowed out of the Northern Baptist. What used to be Northern Baptist is now American Baptist. They were on the right side of this situation. The, 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 the yeah, amen. The, um, the Southern Baptists, by the way, repented of this, of, of their, their racist pro-slavery roots. And by the way, we're very thankful to be part of uh, to be host here and to be, de be able to use this facility uh, with our American Baptist brothers and sisters. But this is what Greer said. This is very recent. He called on, on Christians within the Southern Baptist denomination over which he has, has um, oversight to say Black Lives Matter. Now, also, he was careful to clarify that he and his church do not endorse the organization, the movement, and the website that has been hijacked by political operatives whose worldview and prescriptions would be deeply at, at odds with his own. So, in other words, he's saying there's a lot of things that the organization believes in that I repudiate openly. But he's, call, he's calling his church to say yes to that. Here's another guy. This is probably the most conservative evangelical in America. Albert Moeller. The president of Southern Baptist Seminary. Those three words, Black Lives Matter, are being embraced, I'm quoting him, by Americans of every race and religion, and they are profoundly true because God made every human being in his image. I'm going to expand on that. Um, as I said in my, uh, in my message um, that I'll record and put online because I want to bring this to a close. I, you know, I started telling you about this doctor at, at Keck USC Medical Center. Read, read what he has to say. And you know, I, I thank God everybody here is wearing a mask that has to, um, and they can. But people are challenging these things, and among them, you know, believers that are suing the state of California. What, I, I ask, what kind of a witness is that to the governor of the state from evangelicals? Christians screaming about their constitutional rights. Let me tell you about our rights, friends, because we're beholden to a, a bill of rights that is a greater law for us. It's called the law of love. And Paul calls it that. In fact, in, in Romans 13, 8, he, he calls it a debt of love. He said, I am obligated to Greek and barbarian. I have a debt of love. And so I wear a mask in public, not to protect myself primarily, but because I also have a debt of love to all men and women. I don't want to be the source of infection to them. <laughs> Excuse me if you know if I'm if I'm rambling, but I think my message can be distilled in 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 the, in this way. And and again, I'm going to follow up with some postings, things that I 
I think we need to listen to. We need to listen to, we need to listen to the black voices today. We need to listen to our brothers and sisters. We need to stand, and, but then go beyond them. And I'm taking some steps personally. I reached out yesterday to the pastor of, and I, 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 you know, I told her in, in um, Tamala and William of the, the pastors of the um, Purpose Church that were in our building for, for many years, I understand, that I just want to get together with them. I want to talk to them. I want to hear from them. I want to... I want to do what we didn't do when we, when we were un, in the same, under the same roof. And maybe invite them to come and you know, stand at this pulpit and share with us. So I reached out to them by message yesterday. Another thing that I want to do is connect with our local police departments. And, and pray with these you know, men, brave men and women. But also to hear them, to hear the things that we can do. So that in our community... There's more understanding. There's more cooperation. There's less of a tendency toward, toward brutality. It just so happens that on the same day that Lewis and, um, and, and, um, and J.I. Packer and, and Vivian died, J.T. Vivian, um, it was discovered um, that... Um, who was the woman that died? Um, Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor, after she was shot eight times... A woman who was an, uh, an emergency medical technician. Um, was sh she was shot eight times when the police broke open her door, in, I believe in Louisville. She was in their custody for 20 minutes alive after she was shot. And they, she was denied medical attention. This is why more protests broke out yesterday over this anger. And this is what's happening. I, I, don't, I don't condone violence. I don't condone looting. But I understand the source of the rage. And it, the source of the rage, as M.L. King said six decades ago, is the outflow of not being heard. So let's be the difference. Let's hear people. Let's read things that challenge us. Let's read White Fragility. A book that can scare the living daylights out of you if you're white. This is what began the journey for me, is reading things I didn't agree with and putting myself in the place of humility. This is the Holy Spirit ness. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not calling you to, to change, change. I'm calling you to hear. I'm calling you to listen. Spurgeon was a courageous man. In the 1860s, he was an abolitionist, a British Baptist and an abolitionist. This is what he said. He wrote a series of letters to a, a Boston Baptist paper. Just, just to give you the idea, the, the roots of, and, but also an example of what we need to do, of how we should be if we want to be part of the solution and the change. He said, I have written a letter to an influential paper in America and will see to it that my sentiments are really known. I believe slavery to be the crime of crimes, a soul-destroying sin, and iniquity which cries aloud for vengeance. This in a, in a time in America where, uh, you know, this is 15 years before the Civil War would begin, 20 years actually, a decade and a half. You know what happened in the South? when they read Spurgeon's letters. Now, by the 1860s, you know what? He, read, he wrote this a little later, in the late 50s, early 1860s. By, by, the, by, the, um, by, by the time he was writing this, when he wrote this, his sermons were being printed in thousands of newspapers all over the world. You can read almost every single one of, of Spurgeon's sermons, which are tremendous. Because at every... Every time he preached, somebody, somebody was writing down the, the, you know, the, they copied his manuscripts and they printed them on the newspaper. This was the influence that he had over evangelicals back in the 1860s. You know what happened in the South? This is what happened in the South. This is a clip from the Montgomery Mail. This gives you an idea of the roots of this issue that are so deep. But it says Spurgeon is in, in danger of an auto de fe. And 
That's a word for um, being a public heretic. He was decried as a public heretic in the South. The Montgomery Mail, Alabama says, a gentleman of this city requests us to invite, and we do hereby invite all persons in Montgomery who possess copies of the sermons of the notorious English abolitionist Spurgeon to send them to the jail yard to be burned on next Friday, this, this day, this day week, a subscription is also on foot to buy one of our booksellers all copies of said sermons now in their stores to be burned on the same occasion. Does anyone say nay? Nay. nay. I say nay. nay. I say nay. <laughs> Here's what I want to end with. <laughs> I say nay. <laughs> Uh, let me see if I can find this. This 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 will be my my closing thought here. Um, somebody said prayer is not prayer is not a preparation for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. The place of prayer. And it's in, that, in, a pla- in the place of prayer where we can, we can hear God, we can humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and allow ourselves to become the change by listening, by being courageous, by doing things that are not easy for us. It takes guts to read White Fragility and other books that I'll, I'll recommend. You may not agree with everything that's said there by the author. But this will lead to this new wine, this new wineskin that I believe that the Lord is creating out of this. God is at work. If it's not the end of the world, he's at work. So I'm going to start this little group. I've been kind of hinting, and there's a few people that are already, you know, this is up to you whether you want to be a part of this. I'm going to do it on Zoom. And it's going to run for maybe five or six weeks. If we decide to make it longer, so be it. We'll see where God takes it. But I felt that, you know, that as, as a pastor, that my, the, the, the most important thing that I can do right now is to influence this church toward more prayer, individually and corporately. And so if, if you can't join us every Wednesday for prayer, try to join us at least once a month for prayer. And try to join us after church at least once a month for prayer. I know there's some very busy lives out there. But I believe that in this season, there's a desperate need. We, we are in a time of crisis. Things are being shaken right now. God is shaking things. And the things that are not, that can be shaken, just, you know, out of the Bible, will be shaken, will be removed, so that only the things that cannot be shaken, the things of the kingdom of God, can remain. And these are the three books, you know, that I want to, I want to use in this, uh, um, this Zoom thing that we're going to do on Tuesdays. If you want more information on that, uh, send me an email to, you can send it to info at vineyardmonrovia.church. Info at vineyardmonrovia.church. And I'll send you information on how to um, get these books. Some of them are available free online, like with Christ in the School of Prayer. But I think this is a season... Um, for us to, to deepen, deepen our prayer lives and to grow in that. To just come before Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to pray. To start with that. You know, I can tell you, you know, as a, I've been a follower of Jesus for over 40 years. I'm, I'm, I'm in desperate need of learning to pray. So whether you're a part of this class or not, you know, get some of these books. Do whatever you can. There's so many materials, so many ways to learn from people who have, who have successful prayer lives. Because this is the essence of our calling. Jesus called us as a kingdom of priests and kings unto our God. Priests are intercessors, first and foremost. They stand before God and the people. And kings are people that exercise authority. Both things happen in the context of prayer. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day.
Lord, take this vineyard that you planted, the Vineyard Church Monrovia, and make us new wine. That's a difficult prayer to pray because that process <laughs> involves crushing, involves filtering, involves removing things. It's something only God can do. Take us, Lord. Make us new wine. And Lord, you are the one who also creates the wineskin, the new form of what we will look like, what will come out of this. And we bless what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we, we pray. Amen. So I'm going to be going on Zoom in a moment just to get this, this prayer meeting started because I've got to rush over to LAX uh, to pick up our, our uh, grandbabies, our granddaughters, <laughs> and um, our, our son and our daughter-in-law. We, we really we haven't seen them in a year. We miss those little babies. Uh, so Carol, if you're listening, uh, I'm going to turn everything over. I'm going to make you the host so that um, Carol Ann, yeah. That you can pray. And next week we have a very special, very special treat here because um, Carol Caldwell will be speaking. I understand it's going to be like a two woman show, Carol and, and Kathy. I, I, don't, I don't know. But um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the message. She told me a little bit about what God's put in her heart. I'm looking forward to that. In the meantime, have a wonderful week. God bless you. And uh, stay humble. Love your neighbor as yourself. And one of the things that that means is listen. Listen to your neighbor. Listen to your neighbor. God bless you. Bye-bye.